Hello, I am Karim Simon, Chair of the Department of Music at the University of Prince Edward Island. Welcome to this edition of our Distinguished UPEI Music Alumni Series. Throughout this series of podcasts, we invite our music alumni to share their music and professional journeys. In so doing, we look to our alumni's past as a means of informing and perhaps inspiring our current students. Today's guest is musician, university professor, pedagogue, scholar, and administrator, class of 1978 alumnus, Dr. Betty Ann Yonker. This podcast is being recorded in late January, 2022. I am in Charlottetown and Betty Ann is participating from her home in London, Ontario. Welcome, Betty Ann. Thank you, Dr. Simon. It's good to uh, see you. Betty Ann, uh, could we begin, please, by having you describe your childhood and music-related experiences? I was eight years old when I began piano lessons. I was also singing in school, school activities, a school choir. I was singing in the church choir. Music was part of our lives in a, minim, in a, in a medium way. My mother played the piano, sing songs were a regular occurrence in our home. My father was an appreciator of music. And of the four brothers, one other pursued music activities in high school when he decided to try to learn the piano and string bass and did quite successfully, actually. Good. And yeah. so at, at what point did your music involvement evolve to the point that you want, wanted to study music at university? Well, I think, I think it was per, quite, um, it was mainly because of the school-based programs I was involved with, but the singing, middle school, uh, junior high school, I started the band program in Charlottetown um, with Jerry Rutan. I started to play the clarinet and I got immersed in this band world, the band repertoire, the band culture, continued on to high school. There were a few of us that Jerry would ask to come join the high school band when we were in ninth grade for the eight o'clock morning band practice that was held every day. And so that was sort of exciting that I was playing alongside some well-known musicians like Rowan Fitzgerald at the time and Frank McKerney, Marjorie McKerney, Marjorie Smallwood. And then in high school, I switched to flute, which is what I really wanted to play in the first place. So I loved the flute and continued on. And then we had a really strong band program. The, um, the expectations to play well were high and I appreciated that. I, had, I was involved in a, a ton of other things, sports-wise and student council, social activities at school, but band was a pretty significant part of, of my high school life, I would say, as well. In high school, Jerry had uh, the um, tradition in 12th grade of calling in a couple of students and telling, telling them that they should go on into music, that they were strong musicians and would become strong music educators. So we didn't really question that. Kathy Giz, Ronnie Murphy and I were the three that were brought into his office. Ronnie and I went on into music and then Kathy went on to occupational therapy but continued to play her bassoon. But it was really Jerry having that notion of targeting people that he thought would contribute to the field. I don't know if I thought I was good enough to go into music, um, but he did and that meant a lot. So I went home and told my parents that I wasn't going to do social work or law, I was going to go into music <laughs> though and continued on and, and after that then. Very well. So why did you choose the University of Prince Edward Island? Well, I applied to UPEI and Mount A and was accepted to both. And I decided to stay at UPEI for, for two reasons probably. One being that I felt um, I could save some costs by staying on the island. But the other one was the flute teacher at the time, Hank Eichlenstein, had a really great reputation. And I aspired to want to study with him and be able to be influenced by his, his pedagogy and his musicianship. Uh, 
Oddly enough, my mother was pushing me to leave the island. She thought I needed to spread my wings a bit. So I applied to Western from, and got accepted for my second year because at the time you had to do one year outside of Ontario, they had grade 13. Right. Right. So I did get accepted and at the very last moment sent my letter in saying that I wasn't going to go. Um, so I ended up staying at UPEI. My mother was not pleased with me, but we got over it and I continued and finished at UPEI. Terrific. So Betty Ann, could you describe your focus while you were a student here at the University uh, of Prince Edward Island? And, and what about your UPEI music experience really resonated with you? Mm -hmm. I was struck by how I wanted to become a better musician, technically and musically. Um, so those around me who were better than me or who were more accomplished than me really motivated me. So you just started to practice. You realize that if you practice three hours a day, Hank would give you a two or three hour lesson and you would get better, oddly enough. So that was a real focus in terms of improving uh, my musicianship. And I also did that through choral singing with Carl Mathis. That, uh, I, I learned a lot about singing in a chamber choir with, with, uh, with, with Carl, and I appreciate that balance, blend, musical line, nuances, the repertoire. Um, another influence there, uh, Alan Reeser was just like a storyteller of music history. It wasn't just facts. It was about stories and interesting ideas that were happening at the time. Hirley Athelstadt was a huge influence from a music education pedagogy perspective. Kodai was introduced, Sofej. So I started to, you know, Sofej in terms of oral skills, musicianship oral skills, which I think we all enter university not having had a lot of experiences with. Um, so those were really, I, I would say that they contributed to a strong foundation pedagogically, musically, historically, um, while I was at UPEI. And so it was a good, it was a good all around education. The final thing that really struck me besides the sense of community there um, was that they never separated a musician and a music educator. Musician educator were one concept onto itself. It wasn't, you're not good enough to play, therefore you'll go teach. It was the notion, if you're gonna teach, you better be a strong musician if you're going to teach students through music. That concept was pretty, I would say pretty consistent throughout all the faculty in my time at UPEI, so. Well, thank you for reinforcing that. I, I think that's really so important. Um, might you mention uh, some of whom were among your classmates while you were at UPEI? Oh, we had a rich bunch, personality-wise and musically. With Dan Sinamond, Eric Marshall, and Germani, Alan Dowling, Estelle McKinley. Um, there was Pat, and there was uh, Teresa Leonard, and Mark Thibault, Mark Thibault. Rowan Fitzgerald appeared on the scene after he decided to come back to the island to do um, music. Ruth Ann Reed, Kathy Dempsey, Heather Harris was in her fourth year when I was in my first year or so. It was quite a group of uh, people. We had we had a lot of fun. In there you go. I, I recognize most of these names. Good, very good. So, uh, you graduated from UPEI. Then what happened? Well, I was sort of at a crossroads in my life, per per personally as well as educationally. So I took a year. I was accepted to Mount A for my BED, and I went for one day. And realize I, I don't want to do a BED. If I'm going to go back to school, I need to stick with music. So I took a year off, worked, uh, did some teaching, some skating, and then I went off to Penn State. I applied to three places, Maryland, Maine, and Penn State, drove down to visit all three campuses, which was sort of unusual at the time, and entered a master's of education focused on music education at Penn State. Hmm. But that was in sort of a, the school of education and I wanted to keep making music. So I, I auditioned for wind ensemble and the chamber choir, got into both, took flute lessons and did a, a half recital. And so I was able to continue the academic side of a master's program as well as the musical side. Good, very good. And so you graduate from Penn State and then what did you do? I got, a, I got a job for the summer at Simon Fraser. My advisor, David Boyle, 
knew um, who the person who was who was hiring at, at Simon Fraser for the summer. So I taught four sessions of music methods to education majors. Hmm. Really lucrative, make good money, spent the summer on the West Coast, did some traveling down into the States. It was great. Then I had applied for school jobs and got a job in Connecticut and one in Newfoundland. Newfoundland. And I decided I would go to Newfoundland because I had never been there before. There you go. Okay. New Karen Murray and Mark Tubow, who were at UPEI, were teaching in Newfoundland at the time. So off I went to central Newfoundland and I started a band program and taught elementary music, choral music, bands. Um, and I stayed for eight years and I learned a ton. And I, I got involved with the with the Newfoundland Music Educators Association with a, a great group of people and learned learned a lot. It was good. Uh, yeah, among the things I find fascinating uh, about your background, Betty Ann, is that you weren't just uh, an instrumental music educator, you were a choral yeah. educator okay. as well. And, and I know both of those through your flute playing and through your singing um, have provided you with a very strong musical foundation. Thank so you. eight years of teaching in Newfoundland and then what? Well, then I had already started to pursue looking at PhD programs and I wanted to go where Bennett Reamer taught because his philosophy book in undergraduate with Hilary Alfestadt and again as a master's student with Keith Thompson really resonated with me. And I thought, well, if I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a PhD, where will I go? Who, who has influenced me that who I don't know? And Bennett's name popped up and sort of stayed in my brain. So I, I found out, did some research that he was at Northwestern University. So I started to do some courses in the summer and then we moved to Prince Edward Island and I taught for a year at Birchwood replacing Perry Williams for the hmm. year. And then I left there and went down to Northwestern to, for full-time coursework, right. finished okay. my coursework. Terrific. And then it was 1991. And I thought, well, they wanted me to stay and do some teaching for uh, a, a professor who was expecting a child, first child. And, the, and then also there was an op opening at UPEI. So I applied for that. Somebody else got, it was a secondary woodwind focused band job. And Somebody else got the job that I thought was a great hire. Good. And I knew there was another opening happening in 92 that would be more for elementary music methods and teaching some flute. And so I came back to the island and was a sessional for a year. And then that was one year and then five years as a full time until 1997. And of course, the other person who got the job was the one and only Dr. Simon. There you go. Betty Ann, thank you for that. So could you describe your years as a professor in the music department at the University of Prince Edward Island? What, what courses did, did you teach? Did we start I taught there? everything. I taught second year history. I taught oral skills, flute, some pedagogy classes, the elementary methods classes. Um, I worked with students out in the schools. It was really busy. But I also got to play again more regularly. Um, but the the thing that struck me was that you know you go back to an institution where people taught you and are still there, and so they never taught me as they never approached me as somebody who you were a student of ours and we will tell you how you're going to do this. Mm. But rather they sort of looked and treated me like a colleague right away. And I really appreciated that notion of professionalism. And of course the newer faculty was Dr. Simon and Dr. Greg Irving. Yes. Who were, who were teaching there as well. So. Good, very good. Um, uh, I just would like to, to highlight the fact that um, you know, you were for this what five or six year period, you were our flute professor. And uh, in, in addition to all these academic courses that you were teaching, okay. music education courses and looking after our teaching internship program, you were principal flute of the Prince Edward Island Symphony Orchestra, and you were recitaling all of the time. Oh. And, and, and this blend of, you know, I'm, I'm a musician in addition to being 
a pedagogue and a scholar and 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 all that goes into that are among uh, for me uh, the, the most Im impressive aspects of of your career Betty Ann so after you taught at UPEI what what happened well at, at during while I was at UPEI I was dissertating I was lugging out the old VHS camera into schools to collect data for about three months and writing the dissertation that took two and a half years. Um, so then a job at Western came up in 1997. And again, I wondered, is this a move? Should I leave? Because I was, you know, UPEI was a great place, great community, as we know. But the, the difference was that I was going to be able to teach, I was going to be able to work with graduate students. And the experience at Northwestern was extremely rich, highly influential. And it, it prepared me to, to work with graduate students and I wanted to. So that was sort of the, the deal breaker. And I went off to Western in 1997 and stayed for three years. Terrific. And then after three years, at Western, there was a calling elsewhere. Could well, you speak phone, to that? Phone call came from a former professor at Northwestern who was then at Michigan, the chair of the music ed department. And she had me come teach a summer philosophy class to graduate students, um, being honest to me that she was really sort of enticing me to apply for a job that was coming up at Michigan. So mm -hmm. again, you know, do you make the move? You've settled into a good job or do you stay? But I. But again, the enticement was, it was into the Big Ten. And I had grown yeah. up academically in the Big Ten with my master's and PhD. And I just wanted to see what it was like and if I could be successful and get tenure at a Big Ten institution. Um, I, I was curious about it. And people who I'd gone to school with at Northwestern were, were in that arena. And so it was like coming home in a way to go back into the Big Ten um, at Michigan. So I accepted the job in 2000 and, and was there for 11 years. There you go. Good. Uh, for those who are listening to this, Penn State, Northwestern, University of Michigan are all Big Ten schools. Right. Good. So, so while you're at the University of Michigan, you get tenure. Mm -hmm. And then you become chair of your department. Yes. Was, and then you yeah. become an associate dean. Could, yeah. So so could you speak speak to those um, uh, achievements and responsibilities? Again, it's it's an ask, right? Somebody taps you in the shoulder and says, "Go up for tenure. We like for you to be chair of the department." And then I was in that position for two years, and a new dean came in, and Christopher Kendall tapped me in the shoulder and he said, your name has come up as a possible associate dean for academic affairs. So with, it was helpful to be, you know, I was chair of different curriculum committees and when I was still an assistant professor before I got tenure. So what it did, what it did was it really allowed me to get to know the world beyond my music ed world and music education in general. So it required me to understand the vastness of the School of Music, Theater and Dance at Michigan, but everybody else's desires and wants and curriculums and programs and values across the fields of performance and history and technology and dance and musical theater and so on and so forth. And I found that to be really helpful. And I really enjoyed it because it gave me a sense of a bigger picture. Hmm. So I thought, hmm, this is interesting. I mean, administrative administration is a lot of work, as you know, mm -hmm. it takes up a ton of your time because, um, it's about everybody else, which is okay, which is fine. And then going into the associate dean's role, it allowed me to even like understand at a greater perspective how the university functions, how a university functions when you're trying to make curricular changes and work with budget, work with students. I had a scholarship budget of $6 million for masters and undergraduate students that I, so I had to, you know, get at home my skills about um, budgeting and, and using statistics, et cetera, that I, that I acquired in my graduate work. So I, I think I just enjoyed the challenges of seeing bigger pictures and, and being part of that strategic thinking of programming and students' well-being and their education and trying to make it a better place for them in which to work and play. So good, very good. So, so you spend eleven years at the University of Michigan mm -hmm. in your various roles as a professor, a chair, 
uh, an associate dean. Um, and then what? Well, then the call comes. <laughs> the dean's job opened up at Western. The dean's job opened up at University of Western Ontario, University of Toronto, and Wilfrid Laurier University the same year. Wow. So the call came. And again, you're asking, is this the next move? Will this be the last move? This will be moved back into Canada. Um, this will allow me to go back to an institution that has a, a large music education program with graduate work. So that's attractive. So off I went and the job was offered and, and I decided to take the, the job as Dean. So at the same time, Don McLean at Toronto, Glenn Crothers at Wolfe Laurier and myself, we all arrived in Ontario at the same time. And so I, I visited each of them separately and then said, the three of us need to get together on a regular basis for Dean's therapy so we can learn the ropes here in Ontario at the same time as, as the three deans of, it's the three deans of Ontario really. In the there you go. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's quite a trio of yeah. deans, quite a trio. Good, very good. So your 10 years as Dean at Western, um, could you uh, speak to um, various issues that you championed while you were there and maybe even some challenges that you had to address? I think the, the, the opportunities that came up when I got there and things that each dean comes in and there's things that need to be worked on that the previous dean didn't do because they did other things. And that's why these jobs are recyclable. That's why I call them the turnstile jobs. We're in the turnstile and then we exit and leave room for somebody else. So when I came in, there was a need to, to really strengthen relationships with alumni, with community members in London and to really get an aggressive development donor relationships program going. So that, those were the first things. We needed to look at curriculum and we also needed to look at continuing to strengthen our uh, base of faculty. But a big project that came on my lap that I didn't expect was a building. When I arrived, there were to be renovations for Talbot College. We have two buildings, excuse me, Talbot College. That when I came, apparently it was over, it wasn't going to be able to work. So the head of the budget on campus visited me and I said to him, so what would that money build if we were to build a new building? And so we started, we built a building basically. It was in four phases. It took a lot of time. We had to find, we had to, we had to uh, refashion spaces to put faculty while the construction went on. Some people stayed in parts of the music building as long as they could. <laughs> people would move them out and, it, it took a, it was a long project, but it worked and we have the building built and we have 20 spaces named and we raised over $2 million. And so. Yeah, that's, that's a remarkable accomplishment. Yeah, that's a project. Yeah. <laughs> that was a project. Please. And then we started to address some curricular issues. Some challenges were budget. Uh, we had a dip in enrollment for a couple of years and that is, that impacts budget right away. I call it cheeks and seats syndrome. Yep. And, and the budget model um, at, on any campus is fixed in that it's the same for all different faculties. So it's, it's pretty much the same model with a few variations on the theme. But it's hard for any school or faculty department of music to function because we are, we here at Western, we compete with dentistry to be the most expensive area on campus to function, to run. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's the it's it's what we do. It's the one-on-one -on -one instruction that is so expensive, but that's vital, as you know, to our students' education. So there it's a go. constant, constant talking about and educating and um, in conversation with the, the powers that be who hold the purse. Of course, and and this is a common issue at all music schools and some sometimes we happen to get the ears of some very sympathetic and understanding senior administrators yeah. and uh, it's great when that happens but we have to pay the bills i'm responsible for the budget of course so i get that so so betty ann as you reflect on the scope and breadth of your career to date how did your UPEI undergraduate degree prepare you for all that has happened since? 
I think a foundation academically and musically, a notion of, of discipline to be to excel, the notion of musician and musician educator is critical. And also the sense of community is, is a value. I'm not sure if it's a full East Coast thing or if it's areas that we've grown up in, but that's a huge value that we need to carry with us. There you go. And, th and those are values that uh, remain true, mm -hmm. I think, here at the University of Prince Edward Island. So you have spent 10 years as Dean of Western. Um, what are you doing now? What projects are you working on? Well, I am afforded a year's academic leave. So in 40 years in the profession, I've never had a sabbatical or a leave. The closest was going away to do my coursework at Northwestern. So um, it's been a real shift, I'll tell you, but it's been good. I am working on some research projects, one with an undergraduate student, and, and about the use, the impact of music in the brain. Another, it's about a, it's a, with um, a graduate student and some undergraduate students and a colleague about leadership attributes and abilities, attributes really, leadership within an El Sistema program. Another one is finished now. It was with the National Study on the Status of Music Education in the country. I was asked to help out and do some writing. That one's been put to bed. And then, um, there's a, a four, how many of that was three, I think. I think that's it. Another one that I want, I do want to write about leadership. I do want to write about these leadership roles. Um, I'm not quite sure yet, but I, I've collected a lot of books. I took, I take notes at every meeting. Every meeting that I had, I've taken notes. So I've got a whole slew of books that I want to go through. So that's sort of later, but I have all the, these other research projects in the go right now. Betty Ann, in what professional organizations have you been associated and why is this important to you? Oh, I think it's really important. It's called connecting to a community outside of your own domain, your institution, which I think is really important. I've learned so much from so many great colleagues across so many organizations. When in Newfoundland, I was part of, I was active in the Newfoundland Teachers Association. Um, when I was in Michigan, I became president of the Michigan Music Educators Association, which made me, got me in contact with presidents across the states. I've been very active in the College Music Society, which I love because it involves everybody in the profession of music, your historians, your musical theater, your music technology, your music business, your music theorist. Your music. So I really love that organization. I've been on the board, I've been program chair, I served as president. I just finished chairing a, a, a search for executive director last fall and we finished that one up. Um, and then in Ontario, uh, well, I was involved, I've gotten involved in the CAFA Canadian Association of Fine Arts Deans by meeting with them. And then here in London, I've gotten involved in the London Arts Council. I was president of that for a while. I was on the board for quite a while. And now I'm president of the local Kiwanis Music Festival and I'm serving on a board with the London Symphonia. So there's, I feel it's important that we get connected to the community out, off the hill, I call it, outside the academy, uh, mm -hmm. out of the university, into the community. There you go. And also that we become really connected with our colleagues within the profession. You learn a ton, you learn about how other people do what they do, but also it brings whatever institution you're out into their environment. So they get to know more about the work that's done at your school. It's a recruiting tool as well. Yeah. So I really believe strongly in, in um, getting involved in the community. There you go, good. You know, uh, I recall, Betty Ann, that, that your father was a Rotarian and uh, motto of Rotary is service above yeah self and uh, uh, your career seems to reflect that. Um, Betty Ann, what message would you have for the current music students at the University of Prince Edward Island? Uh, <laughs> well, I always, and my father asked me this when I came home and told them I was going, I'm going into music next year. Really, I am. 
how will you support yourself? I'm not sure, but I'll figure it out. But at the end of the day, they asked me why. And, and, and I said, I don't know. I just really love playing and being part of music. And dad did say to me, and, and I, I agree with him, that you have to be passionate about what you do. You get up in the morning every day and you go to, you go to work. And that passion has, con- has to continue to fuel you through. And it also defines the value for why you do what you do. Because there are days that are just brutal. There are days that are just brutal. And you come home and you wonder, really? What am I doing anyhow? Ah, you kidding me? But you pick yourself up and you remember the value of what you do and why you do it. And it just continues to fuel you. So I think that's critical. Um, And the other thing, and I think it helps those days that are brutal, like the really tough days, right? We all have tough days, um, is the notion of continuously learning. I just continue to learn every day. Students, staff, faculty, colleagues, no matter where I go. And that continues to fuel the passion as well. And if you stop learning, then that's going to impact, I think, the level of excellence of, to, to excel. Of you're continuing to excel to be the best that you can be. And if you're doing that, then I think it's going to help the students as well excel in what they're going to do. Because you understand the value of learning. And that's huge. So Terrific. That's a nice message. So finally, Betty Ann, what's next for you? Ah, well, uh, I'm in the process of getting my health back. It's, um, I've made choices that probably, you know, I made choices about my work life balance or imbalance. And then uh, I have the year and I continue to work um, on the research projects. I'm also playing in the community band here, which I've done for nine years, playing my flute. And then next year I'll go back and I'll be a professor for a year at Western. And then I will retire in 2023. Terrific. Betty Ann, I'm very grateful to you for sharing your professional journey with us. On behalf of the UPEI music community, please accept our best wishes for your continued professional success and professional happiness. Thank you, Dr. Simon. It's been a pleasure.